Hi, I'm Austin, and I'd like to welcome you to Connection Church Online. Our purpose at Connection is to connect people to Jesus and one another. Our Sunday worship service is a great opportunity for us to turn our focus to Jesus and connect with Him. In a few minutes, we will hear a message from God's Word to lead our hearts to Jesus. If you're watching this live online, interact with others by commenting when something stands out to you. Take notes of what you hear today and make plans to apply God's Word to your life. Our sermon series is called Living Out My Purpose. As a church, we're going to learn how to take God's purposes for our lives and then put them into practice to live them out. We learned over our 40 days of purpose study that God has five purposes for our lives. One, we are planned for God's pleasure. That's called worship. Two, we are shaped for God's family. That's called fellowship. Three, we are to become like Christ. That's called discipleship. Four, we are to serve one another. That's called ministry. Five, we are to share the good news. That's called evangelism. This sermon series, again called Living Out My Purpose, is going to help us put these purposes into action within our church family. I know that we're ready for this. I also want to take time to thank you for continuing to give during this difficult time. Jesus taught us about the kingdom of God more than anything else. But do you happen to know what was second on this list? Our relationship with money. Money is a gift from God, but if it is the priority in our lives, money can be an idol that promises way more than it can deliver. However, with gratitude to God and by faith, our offerings that we give to the church can be an act of worshiping God. We express thankfulness to Him for providing now, and we show our faith that He will continue providing in the future. As you consider your offerings today, we ask that you would do so with an attitude of worship and give as the Lord leads you. I'm happy you're here, and I pray the Lord speaks powerfully to you during our worship service. Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment from God? He answered this question in Mark chapter 12, verses 30 and 31. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul, with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. This is the heart of our purpose at Connection Church when we say our purpose is connecting people to Jesus and one another. Now let's prepare our hearts to listen to the Word of God and to enjoy the message from Pastor Daniel. Hey Connection Church, we're starting a brand new sermon series today. It's called Living Out My Purpose. And our purpose at Connection Church is connecting people to Jesus and one another. We're going to learn over the next eight weeks how to do this, how to live out the purposes that we've learned over the 40 days of purpose we did, and also how to um, and, and the purpose is connecting people to Jesus and connecting people to one another. And there's a cool graphic Austin made for us. So thanks, Austin. And this helps gives a visual for the purpose of our church. So connecting people, connection church, connecting people, connecting people to Jesus and one another. And it, this is good because it shows a progression that we as a people, as connection church, as a church, are to be connecting people to Jesus. That has to be our priority. If we were not connecting people to Jesus, then we wouldn't be doing the job of a church. Um, if we also have a priority of um, an equal priority of connecting people to one another as well. And so if we only did this, if we only connected people to Jesus and didn't do this, we wouldn't be a good church. If we bypassed this and we only connected people to one another, we would stop being a church because a church is the body of Christ. And so we must do these things, connecting people to Jesus and one another. Jesus is the primary focus, which is why he's a bigger name here. He's the center of it all. And we're connecting people to Jesus and one another. Amen? Amen. So here's a thought I had, and it's a pretty heavy one to jump into, but just imagine, what if all your private fights became public knowledge? What if all the, the private fights that you had became public knowledge? People could see into the window of your house and the, the history, and they could just pull up on their phone, and they could, they could scroll through all the fights that you have with your spouse or with your children or with your parents or with your brothers and sisters or with your whoever. What if it all became public knowledge? I know for me, I would be beyond embarrassed because I have said things and done things that I wish I could take back. And so the reason this 
thought came to mind was that right now we're seeing on the news a lot of video. And that video is, is not creating divisions. The video is revealing to us the divisions that are in our hearts. They're, they're revealing the divisions that are in our hearts. And sometimes we can really be struggling with these things that are within us and, and in our fights, and kind of go back to this slide here, but in our private fights here, and we, we, we can, when we go back out into public and we're around people, they say, well, how are you doing? And we can just kind of gloss over, oh, I'm good, I'm fine. Or we could kind of be honest and say, yeah, things are a little you know, tense at home, but we're going to be okay. We're going to make it through it. And so the thing is, we, we need to realize that, that this is not something new and that the injustice that we're seeing is not something new. We can't just sweep it under the rug, but it's just on video now. We're seeing it and, and we're having to deal with it. And so there's in Habakkuk, there is a, a short three-chapter action-packed book of the Old Testament called Habakkuk. And at the very beginning, this prophet of God is crying out to God, Why? Why is this happening? And this is what he says. He says, How long must I cry, O Lord, and get no answer from you? Even when I yell to you, God, violence is all around. I yell this. You do nothing to save those in distress. Why do you force me to see these atrocities? Why do I have to look at this? Why do you make me watch such wickedness? Now, I know some of you feel this too. You just feel like, I can't, I can't watch more of this. Disaster and violence, conflict and controversy are raging all around me. Your law is powerless. Now he's talking to God and he says, God, your law is powerless to stop this. And justice prevails. Injustice prevails. Make sure I said that clearly. The depraved surround the innocent and justice is perverted. Many of us feel this way right now, but I'm so thankful that God receives our doubts and he receives our rebuke of him as ineffective as our rebuke of God could ever be. But this is how we really feel. And so we have to be real with one another. And I talked about this with Brian uh, on Wednesday and again on, on Friday. And we've talked about this at family member meetings that we have to be a community. We have to be a church that is honest with one another. If we are struggling and we feel feeling certain ways and we only talk about those in our little closed rooms with people that we know agree with us, then we're never going to truly grow in our faith. We're never going to have reconciliation among God's people. And so we have to be honest with each other. We have to face the problems. And, and so just realize that the world is messed up. And we will not experience the peace of God by pretending that everything is fine. It is messed up. We have to acknowledge it. So some steps to take. Number one, to face our problems. Let's look at them. Let's call them what they are. Let's face them. Number two, to love our neighbors. Don't confuse our problems with our neighbors. Neighbors are people for us to love. Problems are things we work out. And we focus on those. So face the problems, love our neighbors, support our neighbors, which means that when we need, to, we need to stand up and speak for those who are oppressed. And so we support those who need it, and also finally turn to Jesus continually. This is not just some, something that we're to do one time. We're going to talk about sharing our testimony today. And so your testimony isn't just something that happened a long time ago or whenever it happened in the past. A testimony is something that's living and active, that we're trusting Jesus all the time. It's not just something that happened then. It's something we must choose to do every day. Turn to Jesus continually. So, living out my purpose, connecting people to Jesus, how? How do we help connect people to Jesus? Well, the main thing is sharing your testimony of how you came to follow Jesus is a great way to start. Amen? That's not easy to do because sometimes we have reasons that we don't want to share the gospel. Number one, we think, or we say, I've never really learned how to do that. I don't know even where to begin. I've never learned how. So that's one reason. Number two, I'm afraid that I can't answer questions. I'm afraid someone's going to ask me questions and I won't be able to answer that. Trust me, this is still me too because people ask some crazy questions sometimes and I, I can't answer everything. The third reason is I don't know how to start. I don't know how to start. I got to tell a quick story. Uh, so my friend Shannon, when we were going to seminary and we carpooled together and it was the night, it was Thursday morning because Wednesday night was youth, was youth night. And he, he said, man, I got to tell you a story. I got to tell you a story. I said, all right, tell me. So he said, I was trying to figure out how to tell um, 
uh, this, this youth about Christ and share the gospel with them because you know we'd had conversations before and I knew that it was time for me to share with them. So I was looking for an inroad and we were playing pool in the rec room and uh, pool is eight ball with the, you know, you know, eight ball, you know, pool. You, you, you've been alive. And so we're playing pool and uh, the, I'm playing against the, the youth and he shoots and the ball goes to the corner pocket and goes and it pops out and the youth goes, oh man, that deserved to go in. And Shannon, he said, I saw my opportunity. And I said, well, I tell you what we deserve. We deserve to go to hell. <laughs> and so it is true, but not the best segue into telling a 16-year-old kid about the gospel. Um, and so sometimes we just don't know how to start the conversation. So I want you to be encouraged. Uh, I'm probably going to send a link to this to Shannon just to remind him that I haven't forgotten that beautiful story. Um, but we don't always know how to start, but learn from your failures and learn um, from your successes as well. And so, yeah, this is the thing. We don't know how to start, but if we, we have to start somewhere. So the thing is to start. Number four is I struggle with my own faith. And that's a pretty big one. If you're struggling with your own faith, of course, it's not going to be easy to try to share your faith with other people as well. So a couple things to remember or four things to remember about your testimony because there'll be other things that you'll need to um, uh, remind, yourself of, remind yourself of as you go forward. Number one, every testimony is different. It can be as unique as you are. We come to Christ in different ways. Number two, it's powerful. Just because you hear someone's story that sounds better than yours does not mean that yours is not as powerful as theirs. Number three, it's personal. This is your personal story of how God worked in your life to bring you to faith. Now, there's, the truths of the gospel transcend every you know, the personal experience. But I'm talking about the personal experience of how God wooed you, how He drew your heart to Himself. This is personal. And number four, it's miraculous. The fact that you believe in God and that you're living for Him instead of living for yourself is a stinking miracle. It really is because everything in the world and everything within us screams, Take all you can get and do it for yourself. Take care of number one. And it is a miraculous thing that your heart has been changed by the grace of God. Do not forget that. There are true things for all people. And there are three things I'm going to share with us today that are true for all people. And we'll start with number one. Number one is, I am created to live in connection with God. I am created to live in connection with God. He's created me for this. So it starts with the very beginning that God's desire is purpose for me is to live in connection with him. But before we unpack this a little bit, I want to hear from Brooke. And Brooke is going to share her testimony with us of how she came to faith in Christ. Whenever someone asks me, you know, about my walk in Christ and how I became a Christian, I always feel like my response is probably going to be a little inadequate or hokey. Because I grew up in church, and so I don't really remember a time where I wasn't a Christian. I know I, there was a time, but I remember being very young, three, four years old. My mom like, do you do you want to give your life to Christ? And I'm like, yes, I want to do that. And so I did it, and of course not fully appreciating what that meant, um, but I, I did that. And I, I just always remember being very serious about my faith, wanting to learn more being in children's church, youth church, and taking that seriously, going to other youth churches with friends when I'm in like high school, in middle school. So it was faith was always very important to me. I didn't mind having these kind of discussions with other people, wanting to advocate for my faith, being very passionate about it, um, being passionate about justice and God's heart for justice as well. But I think so for me, the real question isn't when did I give my life to Christ? Because there wasn't you know, often I hear this story and I always hear people saying things like, you know, I was out there, I was in the world and God saved me, he rescued me. I honestly, I didn't have that kind of like crazy experience because like I said, I was, <laughs> I was, I was always a, a, a you know, someone who grew up that way and always took it seriously. Um, so what I did have though for me was when did I make this something that was not just what I learned growing up and that I inherited from my parents, really, but like when did my faith become my own? When did I inquire of God to know God for himself on a different, deeper level? And that really came when I became uh, a religious studies major in undergrad. I'm not I'd already been kind of, you know, like I said, studying, reading, but as I learned more things, you know, 
there's now reason to doubt. There's different information you're being fed in. Like, well, that's not what I learned before. And so there's a wrestling that goes on. And then you really dig in and figure, okay, what about this? That's not what I learned. What about that? And I b began to understand what it means to live by faith and why it's called faith. <laughs> and that serving God doesn't mean that I understand everything about God and that the Bible isn't a, everything you wanted to know about God, but was afraid to ask book. Um, but that also that it's okay to wrestle and that that's how you get to learn God more and that you're praying. And so that's the point where I really said, okay, either I'm going to, either this is real or I'm just going to give it up altogether. And I decided that it is real and I serve God, not because I get it, not because it fits perfectly with everything that I would do, but because I found God to be real. I find the Bible to be true and I want to follow God. I want to follow what is true because if it's up to me, I'm going to be a mess, you know? And so realizing then appreciating anew the work that Jesus did for me on the cross and that I can find my rest and my identity in God. I don't need to keep striving to be anything wonderful because I'm accepted and loved in Christ. Loved in Christ. And so that's, that's my faith journey. It wasn't like I was, because growing up, you hear a lot of stories. I was out there, Shane, I was doing crazy stuff. And I was like, I was never doing that. Am I like, do I, do I still have a conversion story? But it's just, it's that moment where I realized, no, um, I'm going to, despite the doubts, believe, I still find God to be true. And I'm going to follow God because God is the truth. God is real. And that's how I decided to make the faith my own and I've been on that journey ever since with ups and downs but it's a beautiful thing growing deeper in God. Thank you Brooke it's great to hear from you I loved hearing your testimony so let's jump back in here I am created to live in connection with God this is true for all of us God has created us to live in a relationship with him so I want you to look with me in Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 it says then God said now let us, this is the story of creation. He's created all the, the things of the cosmos, and now he's looking at creating mankind. He says, then God said, now let us conceive a new creation, humanity, made in our image, fashioned according to our likeness. God did something amazing, and he wanted to create us in his image, man and woman. And so he goes to do this, and it says, Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God. This is chapter 3, a little bit later. The man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord, they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to man, Where are you? And so this is good to know. That's the story after they had sinned, but it's good to know because it shows us that God was walking with them. He was in relationship with them. It wasn't weird that we're going to find out in just a few minutes, spoiler alert, that it wasn't weird that God was, was walking among them and talking to them. That wasn't weird for them. It was weird that He was hiding from them. And we'll see why in just a few moments. But, but we were created to live in relationship with God, to know Him to walk with Him, to hear Him speak to us. And so that is how God has created us. This answers a really big question for us. He also gave us a responsibility when God created us as well. He didn't just create us just to know Him, but He also had a job for us to do, some responsibility. After He created, He said, And let us grant them, man and woman, let us grant them authority over all the earth, the fish in the sea and the birds of the sky, the domesticated animals and the small creeping creatures of the earth. So God did just that. He created humanity in His image, created them male and female. Then God blessed them. Then God blessed them and gave them this directive. Be fruitful and multiply. Populate the earth. I make you trustees of my estate. So care for my creation and rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky and every creature that roams across the earth. So God gave us a responsibility that He wanted us to do in our life. So we were created for that purpose, for a relationship with God and also with a job to do, a good job to take care of God's good 
earth. So that's the first thing, that I'm created to live in connection with God. All right? The second thing that's true for all of us is this. Sin caused, so write that down. Sin caused and causes. So it happened and it is still happening, the great disconnect. Sin caused and it caused, excuse me, it caused and it causes the great disconnect. And so before we talk more about this, I want to hear from another person and share their testimony. And so Jorge, take it away, my friend, and let's share and the enjoyment of listening to how God has saved your soul. Hey, brothers and sisters. In this video, I want to speak of how God changed my life. This is my testimony. About two and a half years ago to three, I found myself in a place of depression, in a place of sadness, in a place of many questions, in a place where many of us sometimes are hurt and something may be going on in our lives and we don't know how to deal with it. And I didn't know how to deal with what was going on in my life at the moment. I have a son and his son, my son's name is Grayson. And he right now is four years old. But at that time he was about one, one and a half. And I was going through a lot because Grayson was born a beautiful baby. He's my first born son. And we were in love with, with Grayson when he was born as every parent, as all parents are with, with their new kid, with their new baby. And um, it was, it was an overwhelming feeling of emotions. However, Grayson got diagnosed with autism when he was 11 months old. And that crushed me. That completely put me in a state of mind that I ask myself and I ask if there was a God, why me? Why would you do this to me? Why would you send me a son in this manner? I was depressed, I was angry, I had a lot of questions. The doctors didn't have an answer because the autism is not something you grow out of like a cold or something that's temporary, but something that he's gonna live with for the rest of his life. So I was very depressed. All the dreams of me playing baseball with him or going to get a haircut or walking with him down the, down the street or dressing him like me or you know playing or you, all these dreams that I had for him and me to do together Kind of, disip kind of dissipated before me and evaporated. I went to sleep that night. I went to sleep one night. I went to sleep very upset, very angry, sad, in tears. And um, I had a dream that night. And I had a dream that every day when I leave the house, I say to Grayson, I love you, Grayson. I love you, my son. And I walk out. I don't expect for him to say anything bad because he cannot speak. He doesn't understand or comprehend what's going on. He can't focus on a on an object. He He's kind of all over the place. That's how autistic kids are. He has mild autism, but that's how he is. And in the dream, he said to me, I love you too, Dad. And I was shocked. And then he said, I, and Jesus loves you too. And I ran to the room in the dream and I knocked on the door for my now wife, then fiance, and said to her, my love, he's speaking, he's talking to us. And I was knocking on the door and I was yelling that, but she wouldn't open the door. And I woke up. Then something changed in me. I, I, I asked God to, if he wants my life, I will surrender it all to you. I will give you my life in, in exchange that you, that you heal my son, that you allow me to understand what he has. And in that instant, in that moment, I knew something was different. The grace of God finally was upon me and I knew that he loved me and that I was meant to be his father the way that he is. It changed my life completely. I spoke to a friend at work and that friend's name is Mitch and he introduced me to the Gospel of John and I started reading the Bible and understanding because to me, the resurrection, the death, the burial of Jesus was all like a fairy tale, something that people speak about. But I didn't understand that how true it was and how it literally saved us. And he took our punishment on the cross. So I gave my life to Christ. My wife found Connection Church online. We were searching for a church because I became hungry for the word. It was something unexpressible. I could... Um, 
I couldn't explain it. She knew something was different in me and I just wanted to find God. I was seeking um, with such thirst for our Heavenly Father. I got baptized in the Connection Church and I am a born again believer. I believe in Jesus Christ. I love my Lord and Savior. I know what he did on the cross for me. I know that he paid with his body and his own flesh, the son of the living God for me, for my, for all my sins, past, future, and present. And I am a new creation in him. Brothers and sisters, this has changed my life. I accept my son the way he is and I know that God has a plan for him and for me with him. It is amazing. I am in love with the Lord and my mind is on things above, not on things on, of the earth. It is beautiful. It is beautiful. The peace that I have in me, I, the world could never give me. So what I want to conclude the video saying is, God is real. Jesus Christ is Lord and King and Savior. He gave his life for each and one of us. And we all have the opportunity to be in the kingdom of God because of what he did. That is my testimony. Wow, thanks Jorge. I loved hearing how God spoke to you, gave you that powerful dream, and just drew your heart to trust Him in such a wonderful way. It encourages my heart every time I've heard, uh, every time I hear your testimony. So let's get back to this. Sin caused a disconnect, a great disconnect between us and God. We were created to have relationship and responsibility with Him, and sin enters into that picture and disconnects it. And it still causes it today too. It still has this effect on us today. So we're talking about the fall. The great, if you hear about the fall, it doesn't mean just the season. It doesn't mean the season of the year. But the fall is the fall of man, where we were created in this great relationship with God, and then we fell from that. We were banished from uh, the Garden of Eden, and that's because of sin. We also know these words rebellion and resistance. So we have this rebellion against God. We rejected His authority over us and said. I don't want to answer to anyone else. I want to be my own God. And as a result of that, we see the great disconnect. So, Jesus said, or excuse me, God says here in Genesis chapter 3, this is after Adam and Eve had eaten from the forbidden fruit and they had fallen in sin and God had found them. And remember earlier um, it said, uh, I was looking for you, where were you? And then it says here, Adam answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And then God says, well, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? And so Adam and Eve, when they ate of the forbidden fruit, they became aware of things uh, that they were not to be uh, privileged to. It gave them uh, the. It wasn't that God didn't want them to to know things, it's that God was not wanting them to be the one to decree what is good and what is evil. And what they did is they started to trust in the doubter, the tempter, Satan, and say, uh, who came in and, and tempted them and said, hey, you know, did God really say this? I think God just doesn't want you to be like him. And so uh, God knew that because of that, that they had eaten from what they shouldn't have eaten from. And so this is called sin. They rebelled against God and it led to consequences. And the consequences of that sin were pretty severe, or actually quite severe. And the Lord God said, the man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So the Lord God banished him from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. And so this is the consequences that we see. We see that there was this relationship that God had with Adam and Eve that was beautiful, and now that relationship is broken. We see that there was a responsibility that he was given. It was a good responsibility to, to work and till the land, to be trustees over all, everything. But now it was worsened because now the ground isn't going to function the way it was. There's going to be weeds and things. Now there's going to be death that enters into our sphere or our, our lives. And so he says... The same for us is that that's what caused us to be separated from God, okay? That's what caused us. That was the past tense. But now we think, well, that didn't just happen back then. Now we do sin as well, where we do things and we rebel against God in our own ways. So we can't really just look back and blame it all on Adam and Eve. Uh, we need to take responsibility for our own selves 
And it says here in Ephesians chapter, you probably know since we spent a week in Ephesians, I'm going to be quoting Ephesians probably quite a bit. But it says, for, as for you, this is chapter 2, verse 1, and, and Paul is writing to people uh, just a couple thousand years ago. And he's saying, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and in your sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us, you can just highlight that, all of us, all of us also lived among them at one time. And the, the point he's making here is that it doesn't just mean you live among people, but it means that you're doing these things. You're gratifying the cravings of our flesh. And flesh here means the sinful nature, the selfish part of us that me, 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 mine, I want what's best for me. So gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. Now my friend Shannon, when he was you know, trying to look at that entry point to, uh, to share gospel, the gospel with the teenager, he's right. <laughs> what he said was right. Now, was it the best way to, you know, to engage the conversation? Not in the moment, but actually maybe it was because it led to a good laugh and they ended up talking about it. But however, you know, this is a theological truth. It, it, like the rest of everyone else, we were by nature deserving of wrath. This is the great equalizer when it comes to when we look at the world around us and see our neighbors and we say, I can't believe people would do something like that. I can't believe they would do this. This is when the gospel kind of just gets our attention and says, hey, we deserve God's wrath. I deserve God's wrath as much as they do. I deserve God's wrath. So like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. There's this great disconnect where God's created us for this and sin has just made this huge chasm that separates us from Him. Humanity as a whole, we see that the humanity is broken and disconnected from God and we see it individually, that we have responsibility on our part, on our part. So not just for the whole, but yes, the whole for everyone, but also individually that we have a part to play in this. The third thing is this. The third thing is this that's true for all, um, all testimonies. I connect with God only through faith in Jesus. I connect with God only through faith in Jesus. So remember, the first thing is we're created to live in connection with God. That's the way we're created. The second thing is that there's this great disconnect, and that is there because of sin. Sin caused it, and it causes it. It's kept us away from God, and it keeps us away from God. That's what uh, keeps us from having this relationship with God. And so the only way we can have a connection, a true connection with God, a relationship with Him, is through faith in Jesus. And so, I want to hear one more testimony today, don't you? Let's hear from Jess. Uh, Jess, uh, share your testimony with us. We would love to hear it. Hi. Hi. Uh... Pastor Daniel asked me to share my testimony of how I came to accept Jesus in my life. And I am supposed to do it in no more than five minutes. So I am really going to try to wrap it up. Um, when I started attending Connection Church, I didn't realize that I was hurting deeply. And by being there, just going every Sunday, without engaging with anyone, just being very into my own space, I connected in a way that made me very vulnerable and made me feel that all that pain was not necessary for me to carry alone. Um, it took me many questions, uh, several people to inquire, books to read, because I was very afraid. Um, slowly I started to connect with more people in church, attending um, connect groups to ask lots of questions. And I think the bottom line was that my own hurt was not allowing me to see um, that I deserve to live better without pain, with the trust that someone was unconditionally there for me. It was all faith. It is all faith. It is what I found to believe in my heart. 
um, in summary, I was hurting uh, because I had um, I wasn't expecting to get a divorce. Um, the way it happened left me as a single mom in New York with two young children. I felt uh, very much alone and the burden was heavy. I am a, I work full time, so I had to take care of my children, my work obligations, and of course manage that they are engaged and that they do not feel the void of what's happening in their own lives. Um, I also attempted another relationship that became um, very overwhelming um, and emotionally um, draining and, and hurting. I obviously have a history of my encounters with um, different groups or attempts to be in some form of institution, uh, which failed. And uh, I have a very nice, warm, loving spot for connection in my heart because they were very open. They just loved me regardless of me accepting Jesus in my life or not. They were always there. Um, I had several talks with Pastor Daniel and I challenged him uh, many times with all my inquisitive questions and I just always felt accepted. I think I, and this is very emotional for me, but I, I just took a step into being loved and accepted. And I learned that God is always there for me. Jesus became my husband. Jesus became my co-pilot when I was driving my kids alone. And Jesus at times became my partner when I would need someone to pick up my kids and I just couldn't split myself in two. And guess what? Someone always was there. So Jesus always delivered. Jesus has been by my side for many years, many years before I accepted him in my life. And one day, I'll, if we have time, I'll share my full story, which goes back a long time before my baptism. So that's it in less than five minutes. Hey, Jess, you're exactly right. Our, um, our relationship with God means that he's there with us all the time. Jesus is our co-pilot. He's our partner. He's there with us all the time. And one of the things I'm going to talk about in just a second is that our testimony, it keeps growing as we grow. And so I loved hearing how the progression of how God has been ministering to you in your life. That's part of your testimony. And I connect with God only through faith in Jesus. Now, there's two things I want you to talk about this right here. Uh, actually, we will cover it in a minute, but I want to say it now in case I forget later. This faith in Jesus means it, it, it's more com complex than just saying, yes, I believe that Jesus did this for me. Uh, but it's also the, it's, it's having faith or trust and belief in the faithfulness of Jesus. So it, you, it's a constant reminder that my only defense, my only plea is Jesus. My only way to be right with God is His, His payment, what Christ has done for me and, and receiving it by grace and mercy. So through faith in Jesus reminds me I'm having faith in Him. I'm having faith in the faithfulness of Jesus. It's not just... Uh, a simple thing of, of trusting in Him, but it's trusting in Him because He's the only way that you can be right. And so it's a very humbling and empowering truth to know that God has been faithful on our behalf. And we need help. We need to remember this. Like Jess talked about that she just couldn't be split in two different ways and go these two different directions. We need help when it comes to being connected to God. We cannot do it on our own, and only Jesus can save us. Only Jesus can save us. In, in uh, Genesis chapter 2, it says, The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. So there was a job God had for him. And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from 
any tree in the garden. You can have it all, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly what? Die. You will certainly die. There will be a consequence for this. And so God is the one who determines good and evil. And this is where it's a slippery slope for us because we try to play the role of God in our lives today to determine this is good and that is evil. And God is the one who determines that. He is the one who has the, the true knowledge of good and evil. He knows what is good and what is evil. So we need to remind ourselves of this. And sin's penalty because Adam and Eve broke that law. They, they broke that law that God had given them, that commandment. The penalty they deserve is death. Because we have broken that same law and we've sinned against God, the wages of sin, what we earn from sin, is death. But here's the deal. God was merciful then. He's merciful now. And we see in Genesis chapter 3, we see the first sacrifice. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife, and he clothed them. So God said, Adam and Eve, I'm not going to kill you for your sin. But where did he get the skin from? From an animal. And so we see our first sacrifice that God, death had to happen, and God covered them with this skin of this dead animal. He covered them with a sacrifice and clothed them. And so this is actually a merciful thing that God did for them. Death had to come as the penalty for our sin, our rebellion. And Jesus ultimately is the one who became the final sacrifice on our behalf. He's the one who paid that penalty. That's what's so amazing about the gospel. It says, but because of his great love for us. Now remember in Ephesians chapter 2, it left off with this dark um, reality that, that we, like the rest of the people, by nature are deserving of God's wrath. And then in verse 4, there's a transition. It says, but because of God's great love for us, he who is rich in mercy made us alive, instead of being dead, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions, our sin. It is by grace you have been saved from death. It is by grace you have been saved, not something you earned. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with Him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. So this is really cool. God didn't just save us from death, but He raised us up into the heavenly realms. And we are invited in to have this great relationship with God again. In order, He did that, in order that in the coming ages, He might show the incomparable riches of His grace, expressed in His kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. Now, this is a very popular, uh, well-known verse, and for good reason. It, you've been saved through faith. And remember, this faith is, is faith in the faithfulness of who? The faithfulness of Jesus. And so again, he, he clarifies, this is not from yourselves. You didn't do this. You didn't deserve it. So get off your high horse if you think you're better than everybody else. It's a gift from God. And so any of our boasting that we would have would be boasting in the faithfulness of Jesus. It's like, yeah, I deserve hell. I deserve to be condemned for my sin. But praise God, He gave me by grace this gift of salvation. Not by works, which means, again, I am not... Um, earning this salvation. It is a gift from God so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork or masterpiece. This is um, His workmanship that God has knit us together. We are His handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Not saved by our good works, right? But God created us to do good works, to do good things, which God prepared in advance for us to do. This is a powerful testimony. God has saved me, redeemed me. I had no hope except for Him. People say, you're such a good person. You're such, you know, when people tell you, you're such a good person, you can say, thank you, but it's by the grace of God that I am who I am. And I don't deserve to be praised, but who does deserve to be praised? My Lord Jesus. I'm His handiwork. 
God's created me in Christ Jesus to do good works. And he has a job for us to do. Five purposes that we learned in the course of uh, these last 40 days. And so as you think about sharing your testimony, here's something I wanted to share with you. The more we are moved by what Jesus did for us, the more we are moved to share our testimony of faith in him. So the more you're moved by what God has done for you, the more you can appreciate and, and cherish what he's done for you, the more you're going to be moved to share your faith in him. And there's all kinds of ways you can share your faith. It doesn't have to be um, you know, standing up in front of a crowd or even doing a video that I can share with the church. But there are all kinds of ways we can share our faith, and we could talk more about that too. I'll close with a couple of thoughts. I heard this phrase recently, and it stuck with me. It says, hurt people, hurt people which means that right now we're experiencing a lot of that, a lot of hurt going on in our world today. And even just kind of removed from the current events of today, if, if I'm just on my own hurt on the inside, typically I'm going to carry that hurt around with me. And the way that fleshes out is I'm going to, to take that hurt and actually overflow that out onto other people and it will hurt others. It will affect them. And so in sharing your testimony, there was like the fourth one where people you know, kind of resist sharing their testimony was I'm struggling with my own faith. I'm struggling with my own faith. And so that's a hurt. And so the, we need to make sure that we find the healing of God in our souls, in our, that we can uh, have these hurts healed by the gospel because healed people heal people. So if we are healed in the gospel, then now we're going to, instead of taking our hurt and spreading it around, we're going to take the love of Christ, the joy of Christ, and the healing of Him, and we're going to be able to engage the world around us, the people around us, in a way that will bring hope and healing and love and joy and, and true reconciliation and justice. So I want to challenge you to do something. Write these things down, okay? Number one, write down your testimony. Just do it. Who were you before Christ? How did you meet Christ? And who are you after Christ? Just kind of those three things, you know, just write it down. Who you were, how you came to know Christ, and who you are as a result of that. I want you to try telling it. Tell your testimony. Tell it to yourself in the mirror. Which, if you don't like the mirror, just talk it out loud without the mirror. But it's a good practice to tell it to yourself in the mirror as well. The third thing is practice with somebody you know. Say, hey, I want to practice telling my testimony, so I want to practice with you. And so if someone wants to do that, Listen, because it's going to be great. Encourage them. And finally, remember, it's all about Jesus. Take the pressure off of yourself. It's not about you. You're not the star of your testimony. Jesus is. It's all built around Him. So keep pointing to Him. Okay? Um, John 3.30 or John 30. Yeah, John 3.30, I think is where it is. But I think that's where it is. Um, but it's basically John the Baptist said, uh, Less of me... Jesus, and more of you. Less of me and more of you. So remember to keep that focus. It's not about me. It's about the one who came after me. It's about Jesus. That's what John the Baptist was saying. He says, it's not about me. It's about the one who's coming after me. And again, with our testimony, it's not about me. It's about what Jesus has done for me. Amen? Amen. All right. Let me pray for us. All right? Then we'll go. Father, thank you so much that you are the hero of our story, that you are the center of it all. Lord, I thank you for these testimonies today from Brooke and from Jorge and from Jess, and I pray your blessing over them, that you would encourage them, and thank you for encouraging our ch souls today, our church, through hearing their testimonies. And Lord, I thank you so much for the way that, um, that you have promised that healing has come, and while it's not fleshed out, while the world is still hurting and aching, Lord, we know that there is a new day coming, a new heaven, a new earth, and that our promises, uh, or your promises will not go unfulfilled, and our prayers will not go unheard. We thank you, Jesus, for doing the impossible, and Lord, we pray for revival and a renewal and an awakening in our country and in our city, that people would turn to you and as we live in this broken world, Lord, I pray that you would continue to turn the hearts of mankind to you, to trust you, to worship you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. I'll close with today's blessing. May the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I'll see you later, Connection Church.